Hello. Uh, so I know there wasn't a big break between the previous presentation and this one, but time is limited and we're going to get started. Uh, so my name is Shira Atkinson. I'm the Scholarly Communications and Distance Learning Librarian here at Fordham, and I'm interested in copyright from a lot of the author's point of view perspective and how to maintain your rights when you publish. Hello, everyone. My name is John D'Angelo, Head of Access and Circulation over at the Walsh Library. Um, many of you know me from my time also here at Lincoln Center. I've been working with reserves for about 14 years. Um, so my interest in copyright is pretty much on a very basic day-to-day -day level. Um, today's talk, since all of you as faculty are both content users and content creators, we wanted to talk with you a little bit about the copyright implications of your dual roles here at the university. Shira's going to get us started on uh, authors. Excellent. So first of all, we thought we'd talk about what copyright is in the first place, and what it is is truly a bouquet of rights for you to access and use. It refers to your right to reuse an item, to edit it, to use it for commercial value, to disseminate it to other people, and a host of other rights and responsibilities, depending on whether or not you're the creator or whether or not you're the user of a work. I really love uh, today's theme of Faculty Technology Day, uh, digi uh, digital citizenship, because it really does correspond to copyright in many ways, and in two ways in particular, rights and responsibilities as well as law. Today we're going to focus really on the rights and responsibilities aspect of it for, again, for a couple of reasons. One is because copyright is actually it's written in kind of vague language and can be interpreted in different ways. So what that means for you is that you have to be conscious of whatever restrictions exist on using or creating work. And you have to think about who has the right to it and it's really incumbent upon you to be cautious and to be really proactive in how you use a work responsibly. Um, digital law, we are not going to touch on because we are not lawyers. Uh, there are different ways, there are different questions that you would ask a librarian over a lawyer. And because, like John said, he's been working with copyright issues for 14 years, I've been working with it for somewhat less than that, but we still see copyright issues come up all the time, whether it be uh, what items you can put in your digital repository, or what items can you cite and how should you cite it in your papers. However, we are in no position to interpret or apply the law. If you are ever find yourself in that position, then a lawyer is who you should be talking to. Okay, so open access, public domain, creative commons. Open access is this idea that information should be made freely accessible with as few barriers as possible to uh, accessing the information. It's really great, it breaks down barriers, it means that your work is more easily findable, it means that your work, but the same token, is also more easily citable. People are able to find it more, they're able to use it more. So that can be have a really great um, impact on how many people see and use your work. And a lot of organizations, Universities worldwide have actually mandated open access in some shape or form. I happen to find this really interesting because I think open access is really important for the information landscape and to make people knowledgeable and empowered. Um, and the ROAR map, the Registry of Open Access Repository Mandates and Policies, has some really great information. Not all of them are truly mandates, some of them are more guidelines, but if you're interested in that, I recommend checking it out. Um, and one quick word of caution about open access is that, unfortunately, there is a dark side to open access, which is that some publishers can take advantage of it, and they can take advantage of especially younger faculty who are really under immense amount of pressure to publish. Uh, what these deceptive journals and that use predatory publishing practices, what they do is they take your work they don't, and they charge you a fee for accepting your work and then they don't give you 
any editorial board. They don't undergo peer review process. Uh, they can really profit off of your work and then your work, which is great and well-informed, is put up against something that's total rubbish. So it can have a really negative impact on you and unfortunately benefit them. Um, the Beals list has a good list of predatory journals, but the thing about these is they can pop up. So it's always, if you're considering publishing, you should always definitely investigate who they are, what else they've done, and if they are reputable. Uh, there's a couple different models of open access. Gold is the gold standard, uh, which means that in the first place, things are published in an open access platform, means that the final edited, formatted version is also freely available, and there are very few restrictions on how to use it. And a, the model that is maybe more common right now is green, which means that after the fact, an article has been archived in an open access repository. And a great example of this is our institutional repository, B Press. There's um, a link at the bottom of this slide. It's called uh, Research at Fordham. And what it does is it can take work that you have published in other journals, depending, and makes them freely, openly available through our repository. Again, very few restrictions on how it's used and can make your work more readily available worldwide. So a lot of faculty wonder, well, can I actually use this? Is the, the journal I publish in, are they going to allow it? Am I violating copyright by putting my article that I've published in such and such a journal in the repository? And um, that depends on the journal in which you publish. And the best tool to find out whether or not it's OK is this website called Sherpa Romeo. Very easy to use. The, um, you just put in the title of the journal, press search, and then immediately you can see on the right side of the screen here, it'll tell you exactly what permissions you have to use your, uh, your work whether or not you can publish the, whether or not you can archive the published version, the pre-prints, or whether or not you can't at all. So if you're considering using the repository, you always want to check whether or not it's okay first. Public domain um, is this idea that, so through open access, you still maintain your author rights. People still have to attribute your work to you, and you still have rights over what you have created. You can decide that you don't need credit for whatever reason, and that's basically called the public domain. Things can go into the public domain if you actively choose, if you donate your work to the public domain, or if your copyrights have expired over an image. And what that means is that anyone can use your work in any kind of way. They can change it, they can cite it, they can translate it, they can shift it however they want. Um, it's not really yours anymore. It belongs to the public. I'm going to skip that video. Um, but Creative Commons is a different way of maintaining your rights and of maintaining a really granular level of understanding about how your work is allowed to be used and reused by other people. Um, it is a type of copyright license that allows generally information to be shared very easily, very readily online. And it's much less restrictive because you can decide to selectively give away some rights, keep other rights, but you are still very much in control of how your work is being used, and you still get to decide what you are and are not going to allow. Um, it just creates a lot of transparency and a lot of, a lot of control. So there are, there are actually seven kinds of Creative Commons licenses, but um, one of them is CCO, and it means the public domain, so I didn't include that one. Otherwise, there are six different licenses, and they refer to whether or not you want to allow adaptations of your work, 
and whether or not you want to allow your work to be uh, used in com commercial ventures. So there's a ton of information online, including a really neat tool for how to select the correct license for your work and what you want, which rights you want to protect for yourself uh, from the links right there. So as I mentioned earlier, as the scholarly communications librarian, one of my interests is understanding author rights in the first place, and secondly, ensuring that you're aware uh, and that you maintain the rights that you deserve to hold on to. You know, you went through the effort of creating a journal and getting it through the peer review process. That means that you should be able to maintain certain uh, rights over how your work is used and reused. So. And I, I just included this because the copyright transfer agreement is a kind of agreement that you may have with your publisher. And if you sign it, it basically means that you cede all of your rights as author to the publisher. It means that you may no longer have the right to print out 20 copies of your article and share them with your class because you no longer have the rights to disseminate your own article that you wrote yourself, uh, which I personally don't think is right. So, and a lot of other organizations happen to agree with me. There are a lot of addendums that exist. This is just a sampling and you can look at them and then you can go back to the publishers or publisher and say, actually, you know, I want to maintain control over my rights as author and you can work it out. And there's also a great article uh, called Authors Keep Your Copyrights, You Earned Them from the Authors Guild just from two years ago that uh, if this is a topic that's interesting to you, I recommend checking out. All right, and then images. So until now, I've been more focused maybe on text, but it's really important to know that images, graphs, charts, any sort of creative work is protected under copyright provisions. And if you use something, you have to cite something, just like if you create something, then people can't reuse it without citing you appropriately as well. Um, there's this really great flowchart that is far too small to actually read, but it shows some of the complications involved in using images responsibly. It asks you questions like, did you create the image? Is the image based off of somebody else's work? Are you going to get money for posting or creating this image? And so based on all of these questions, you get either a definitive yes, a definitive no, and sometimes you still end up with a maybe or a possibly. And that's because of the, the language in which copyright is written. It really is vague. So again, it is your responsibility as a user and creator of information to sometimes err on the side of caution, to always ask for permissions when you're not sure, to do whatever you can do to make sure that people's intellectual property is being respected and to make sure that you are using information in an appropriate way. So here are just a select few uh, databases that have images that are either all in the public domain or they're freely uh, usable. Some of them do require citation, but a lot of these have some good options. That's it for me. Uh, John's going to talk to you about your use, uh, your role as faculty in using other people's work. Okay. Hello. Okay. So, so far we've really pretty much focused on uh, your faculty work as author. So I'm going to flip the script. We're going to talk a little bit about your role as instructors. Um, obviously, Teaching is a very important requirement, and the materials that you're going to want to use for your discipline are more than likely going to be copyright protected. So we're going to talk a little bit about your responsibilities. Fair use is one of the exceptions to an author's exclusive right to be able to reproduce or make copies of their own work. We here at Fordham, both in the libraries and as a university, we rely on fair use um, to be able to do these reproductions. So for instance, putting materials up online through a course management system or through an electronic reserves platform, 
we rely on fair use. We don't pay permissions. We don't, um, we don't have a budget for that. What we really do is it's for teaching. It's a small portion. It can go on reserve. Um, I have several cards here about fair use, but I'm not going to belabor the point. What I do want you guys to kind of just keep in mind when it comes to fair use is that it is vague. There is no clear-cut answer. There's no magic formula. I wish for my day-to-day -day existence I could simply say 17 pages, that goes up, 18 pages, no. It's not a page number. It's not about the portion. It's really about what it is that you're, re you're reusing, you know, uh, what is the purpose of what you're using it for, and how is it going to affect the person who created this item? Um, so once again, no magic formula, sadly. Um, we've listed some of the examples of fair use on the screen, and obviously teaching and research is one of them. The work that I do, the work that my department does, focuses on two areas of teaching and research. So we're going to go a little bit more into detail with that. Before we do that, one of the requirements, there are a bunch of conditions that allow for fair use, and one of these is ensuring that we put a copyright notice on every library technology that you might use, on every scan that we create. So for those of you who have used our ARIES platform, you will see that when you open up an article you gave us, the first page actually says notice of copyright. If you use our book scan uh, technology inside of the library, you will see this click, I agree to the copyright notice that is available on that, all of our photocopiers, anything with the library, if you're using a copyrighted work, there will be a copyright notice included. It's one of the conditions that we've kind of gone ahead and taken care of for our faculty and students. Um, so when it comes to course reserves, uh, obviously I'm coming from a very reserved perspective here. You can kind of see what's happened over the last 20 to 25 years. We went from having physical materials and photocopiers to course packs, which the students ended up paying an exorbitant amount of money to buy, and to now we use electronic reserves platforms and CMS systems. Currently, we're using ARIES. Uh, those of you who are familiar with ARIES, it actually gives us a little bit more level of control as to what's going into our system and what's available to our students. Um, one of the things that I find most interesting is that this evolution, it's really been tied to the technology that's come out. Uh, it's also made it a lot easier for all of you to get your coursework or get your course readings gathered and um, provided to your students in a much simpler fashion than waiting for myself or my colleagues to file through you know, a, photo a, a cabinet of photocopiers, uh, photocopies. Um, when it comes to electronic reserves, you as faculty do have certain rights. Uh, one of the important things is that though a copyright owner can make their own reproductions and they have the exclusive right to do that, as instructors, you have the right to do it for your classroom teaching. So fair use is one of the things that allows you to do this. Um, you can also take a copyrighted work and be able to do in-class performances and displays. That means basically showing a film in class or playing a musical in class. If it's during your like if it's during your classroom session, it's allowable. Um, you can also put larger portions of material up on an electronic platform, but you do need to get permissions for that. And so if you, on the library site, we have some information about obtaining permissions. Everything that Shira talked about in the first part of this, uh, public domain works, Creative Commons license materials, as well as uh, open access materials, all those can go up on an electronic reserves platform. Um, many of them will require an attribution, but they can go up. There's no extra work needed for that. And lastly, anything that you create, you're the creator, you can put it up. Um, so things like handouts, your presentation slides from your lectures, um, syllabi, anything else like that you can put on an electronic platform. The last thing that we do try to promote the library is that we have we do subscribe to a ton of databases, a lot of streaming material. Um, all of those library licensed materials, you can use the permalinks to put up onto an electronic reserves platform. And basically, it'll take you out of our site and into those sites as part of our licensing agreements. Um, so you're encouraged to use those as well. With these rights come, of course, some responsibilities. One of the major responsibilities is that you provide a full citation or attribution for anything that you use that is not your own created work. Um, very easy to do. It's actually really great, obviously, for the students to see a full citation so they know what it is they're supposed to be including when they submit a paper. Uh, they also require that we have a notice of copyright and everything that's up, which is why the library does that for you. Um, We've created a fair, or we've adapted a fair use checklist that we have up on our library website, and we encourage all faculty to use that as well, just so you can get a better sense if what you want to use fits in with the fair use uh, guidelines or doesn't. Uh, and 
we encourage, now again, this is more of a best practice, it's not in the copyright law anywhere, but we encourage for faculty to look at reasonable limits, okay? We wanna make sure that the materials that are going up on an electronic platform follow what is needed for the class instruction. So it's wonderful to find every item on a certain topic so your students don't have to do the searching, but please come to the library, we'll teach them how to do the searching and use just what you need to teach in class. Again, it's a best practice, it is not, you know, it's not law, it's not in the statute, but it is something that we try to encourage. Um, beyond that, we also encourage you guys to do a periodic review of your course pages just to make sure that the material you're posting is relevant, accurate, up to date, uh, and is necessary for the actual instruction. So moving on from those responsibilities, one other service that we do that ties into copyright is a called document delivery service. Very briefly, we scan items that are in print and we email them to you. Pretty basic service. Uh, we include the copyright page for everything that we scan, so that way you guys can show where the original source is from. It is intended as an ind uh, individual research item, so it's not meant to be disseminated to your class. It's something that would be for your own research purposes. Um, and much like electronic reserves, we rely on fair use for making those scans and sending them out. Okay. I included showing films mostly because it's my favorite exception to the author's rights. Um, as a librarian, one of the things we do try to do is obtain resources, make them available, and get people to use them. Um, we have a very large audiovisual collection, uh, especially here at Lincoln Center, but also at the EIC at Walsh. So one of the things that is very clearly stated is that uh, the creator is allowed to be able to do what they call public displays of their work. So basically showing a film in a movie theater, that is the creator's right. However, for educational purposes, you can show an entire film in your class if it's during your class session. You also can stream it. You can put it online for your distance ed students. There are some conditions that are required, and we can definitely go into that on a one-on-one -on -one basis for those who do distance ed. But if it's part of your instructional activities, you can show a film. Please use our films. They're amazing. Um, we also have streaming services like Canopy, uh, which is one of the databases on our website. If you go into that, you can see a, a ton of movies that we have available that you can show in your classes. Um, however, if you are inviting people, quote unquote, the public, anybody you want to get interested in your department, if you want to do, uh, if you're a club organize, organizer or leader, anything like that where you're doing a movie night, you have to get public display performance rights. Uh, and they're very easy to find. And of course, one of our librarians and myself would be happy to walk you through the process. Um, but this is one of the few clear cut, straightforward copyright, fair use guidelines that we have available to us. Um, so there are a host of fair use resources available on the web. We've compiled a few here. What you'll notice is that many of them are from professional organizations. So I encourage all of you to take a look at your discipline specific professional organizations and see, do they have a code of best practices? Do they have guidelines for how you use materials in your teaching activities? Um, as I said, we've only compiled a few here, but they are out there. We're continually looking for them ourselves and we do make them available to you guys on our copyright libguide, um, which is going to come up next. So there are these additional tools that we've gathered for you guys. One of the major ones is our copyright resource guide, which you can find available from the library homepage. Uh, you see all the tabs that are available there. There's a lot of information and available resources um, for you as teachers and for your students to be able to find out a little more information about copyright, fair use, uh, the Creative Commons, all the things that we've kind of talked about today so far. Okay. And more of the resources. I'm going to let Shira do this last part here, if you don't mind. Yeah. So um, there are a number of other resources available to us, and one of them has been created by Kristen Treglia on her wiki. But the uh, Faculty IT wiki is also a really tremendous source of information. There are copyright uh, courses, and they're put on by really reputable institutions like Cornell, like Harvard, and these are also continually being updated. So there might be new ones out there that we don't quite know about yet. Uh, always worth looking into for such an important issue. Um, and then finally, as I think John really emphasized, copyright is kind of a complicated issue and sometimes there isn't a clear cut yes, you can use this, or no, you can't, or is it okay the way this person is using my work? You're not really sure. Um, but we really try to be available to you to answer any questions that you may have. So our contact information is in that upper corner there. If you want copies of our slides, or if you just 
have copyright questions in general, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. I think we did that on time. <laughs> so that's it.